The Ottawa is a dark stream. The Ottawa is deep. Great hills along the Ottawa are wrapped in endless sleep. Throughout the centuries, the Ottawa River has been a symbol of Canadian progress. The great explorers Brulé and Champlain sailed against its swift current. Then came the pioneers, braving the shoals of the river and the Indians along its shores to homestead Georgian Bay and spread out toward the west. Today, a fresh band of explorers has come to the Ottawa River, explorers in the new world of atomic energy. Everything is made of atoms. Trees, rocks, water, even human beings. Albert Einstein said that atoms though seeming to be solid matter, could be transformed into pure energy. Of course, we have always had feeble sources of energy. The old explorers used energy as heat from their campfires, as wind in the sails of their ships, and from muscles to paddle their canoes. But inside the atom lay unbelievably more energy than this, needing, waiting to be explored. And so Canada's Atomic Research Centre stands on the shores of the Ottawa River. And it is fitting that Canada should be a leader in atomic development, for two of the earliest pioneers studied here. Lord Rutherford, a New Zealander, discovered the natural law governing the spontaneous disintegration of atoms. In 1939, Otto Hahn discovered how to split the uranium atom, and Hitler mistakenly let him publish the facts, leading the Allies directly to the atomic bomb. But Canada's Chalk River Atomic Centre has always been devoted to peaceful atomic studies. Begun with assistance of British scientists in 1944, Chalk River is today wholly Canadian. Nearby in the village of Deep River, where the scientists live, there is an atmosphere of comfortable family life. There are more children in Deep River than in almost any other community in Canada. For the scientists are mostly young married folk. Their average age, less than 40 years. It's a comfortable town is Deep River, with more recreational activities and social clubs than most places the same size. A jail is hardly necessary, for there is practically no crime. People from every part of Canada have come here, and through cooperation, they've built a community to be proud of, or Canada to be proud of. Different denominations take their turns to worship at the community church, and attendance is good. 
At Deep River, Canada's Brain Trust Village, the old values have not been forgotten. It's a peaceful place, a good place to live. But it's a community in which everyone lives directly or indirectly for one purpose, the study of the atom. Though at Chalk River, atomic research is commonplace talk. To most Canadians, it's still a mystery. How do you go about studying atomic energy? The story begins with uranium. Mines like this one at Beaver Lodge, Saskatchewan, produce the uranium ore for Chalk River. With all her mines in operation, Canada will be one of the biggest producers of uranium in the world. Once it has been mined, uranium ore is sent to Port Hope, Ontario for refining. The ore is refined into orange oxide. Brown oxide. and then green salt, which is sent on to a mill to be made into uranium metal. A piece of uranium-235 this size, weighing two pounds, if placed in a reactor, will produce as much energy as 3,000 tons of coal. For use in the reactor, the metal is split so that cooling water can flow through it. Then it's encased in aluminum. At the heart of the miracle of atomic energy lies the question, what is an atom? All things are made of atoms. Water and wood, pins and people, even dogs are made of atoms. Yet each atom is so tiny that some 36 million could lie side by side on the point of a pin. Atoms like this, with tiny electrons whirling around the nucleus. But it's the nucleus that concerns the atomic scientist. It contains protons and neutrons held together by a mysterious binding force. When a free neutron strikes an atom of uranium-235, the atom splits. Two new atoms are formed. Part of the binding force becomes energy, and some neutrons are released split more atoms and cause a chain reaction. The atomic bomb is a chain reaction out of control. In Canada's NRX reactor, a chain reaction is kept under control and complicated though this may seem, it's simple enough in principle. Uranium rods are placed in a container called a calandria. To prevent an explosion, control rods which absorb neutrons are inserted alongside the uranium. By raising or lowering these rods, the chain reaction can be stopped or speeded up. Heavy water is used to slow down the neutrons and to make them more effective. Heavy water is not simply water that has been compressed. It has a different atomic structure than ordinary water. The bulkiest part of an atomic reactor is its shielding which prevents harmful radiations from escaping. This pool test reactor installed at Chalk River in 1957 is different from NRX. It looks like a swimming pool. It is 15 feet wide, 16 feet long, and 21 feet deep. 
The uranium rods are immersed in the water and are easily removed or put back. It is simple in design and fairly inexpensive to build, its power output is low, only about 100 watts. It is used for testing the efficiency of fuels. Soon Canada will be producing electrical energy from the atom. Heat from an atomic reactor will produce steam in a boiler. The steam will drive a turbine, which in turn will power a generator and make electricity. Some 20,000 kilowatts of power will be produced in the demonstration nuclear power unit being built at Deswisha, of which this is a model. A still larger atomic power plant is being designed. It will generate 200,000 kilowatts. The atom, with its almost unlimited energy, is coming along just in time. For by 1962, Ontario will be running short of conventional sources of electrical power. Important though atomic energy already is, Chalk River scientists are still trying to learn fundamental things about the atom. This bullet-shaped machine is called a Van der Graaff generator. Inside it, an unusual sort of target practice goes on. The targets are the atoms of the lighter elements, so tiny that no one has ever seen them and the bullets are the even smaller neutrons. It's a big game hunt in the infinitely tiny world of the atom. The scientists hope to learn more about certain kinds of atoms, what they are made up of, what rays they give off, and what is the mysterious binding force that holds them together? Because it's impossible to see what happens inside the machine, very sensitive electronic instruments have to be used to record what happens. The results are shown on a machine like a television set called an oscilloscope. They all 
also neatly type out the results on an electric typewriter. Research is being carried on with another machine called a beta ray spectrometer. It measures with extreme accuracy the energies and intensities of certain rays given off by the atom. No one can say where this will lead, for it is pure research to enlarge the knowledge of mankind. interesting sites at Chalk River is the refueling of the NRX reactor. Controlled from a room with so many dials, switches and knobs that it looks like a railway switching office. men make ready the reactor. They take an upper section so that the rod can be fitted down inside. has 176 uranium fuel rods, each 30 feet long and weighing 120 pounds. They are carried to the top of the reactor by an overhead crane and then lowered carefully into place. After a uranium rod like this one has been used, it still contains valuable isotopes that can be recovered from it. This is like uh, burning a fire in the grate, then being able to sell the ashes. The production of radioactive isotopes is an important part of the work at Chalk River. They are shipped all over Canada for use in research, industry and agriculture. Besides obtaining radioactive isotopes from spent fuel rods, there are two other ways of making them in the NRX reactor. In the first method, the materials to be irradiated are put into a little ball, and this is dropped into a slot in the side of the reactor. It is pushed through the shielding to the calandria, and finally rolls out through another slot. A wheel controls the movement of the rod that pushes the ball into the reactor. The 
First, the ball of material to be irradiated is dropped into its slot. And then the rod pushes the ball through the inner shielding to lie close to the calandria. Cobalt pellets are irradiated in yet a different way. They are first loaded into an aluminum capsule and then put into a rod. The cobalt is placed in the calandria along with the uranium rods. It takes about a year in the calandria to make radioactive cobalt-60. When it comes out of the reactor, it is very dangerous unless carefully shielded. It can't be handled directly, and even when it is moved, it must be inside a shielding trolley. touch radioactive cobalt, scientists have installed artificial hands to carry out intricate operations for them. The cobalt is contained in chambers with walls 42 inches thick. The man operating the artificial hands can see what he is doing through a giant screen three feet thick, through which these pictures were taken. The screen is made of glass. The hands must open the capsule of cobalt, empty the contents into a hopper, weigh them, and pour them into another hopper, which goes into a shipping flask. It sounds simple, but the men doing this work are experts. There's no place for butterfingers here. The artificial hands are so designed that they respond to motions of the operator's fingers and palm. So skilled are these operators that they can do just about anything with the artificial hands that they could do with their own hands. They've used drills, lathes and punches in working with radioactive materials. The artificial hand equipment is reputed to be the most precise in North America, and sometimes samples are sent up from the United States for handling here.
great Canadian medical achievement was the building of the cobalt beam therapy unit. It is now used against cancer in more than 40 countries. The unit in the new Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto is one of the most up-to-date models. The radioactive cobalt is contained in the head of the machine. The beam passes through the focusing apparatus, which can concentrate the rays in a narrow path. The rays emitted by cobalt-60 are called gamma rays. They must be carefully controlled because they are potentially dangerous to healthy tissue as well as to cancer. As it happens, cancer is more susceptible to them so that exactly enough gamma rays will kill the cancer while leaving normal tissue unharmed. A tumor can be irradiated from different sides thus concentrating a maximum dose of rays in the right place. In this actual X-ray photograph of a cancer tumor, the patient's esophagus, or food pipe, is shown partly blocked by the tumor. Though not a cure-all for cancer, the unit marks a step forward in mankind's fight against disease. Atomic energy, which began in the A-bomb, is growing into one of the greatest servants of mankind, bringing him new power over nature, a higher standard of living, and promising to unlock knowledge of vital importance. We are still at the beginning. The explorers of the atomic age have only begun to show the way, and the pioneers are yet only beginning to follow them. In the future, there are great things in store. Atomic energy for electricity, atomic ships, planes, trains, and perhaps even an atomic satellite in the sky. Canadian scientists on the banks of the Ottawa River are showing us the way to their new world, to our better future and to a broader concept of life. The Ottawa River, a cradle of Canadian progress, traditional highway to Canada's future, finds today a new tradition growing upon its banks, a tradition of exploration in the mysterious world of the atoms.